Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Vice President and Executive Editor at DevX. You're listening to DevX at South by Southwest, our special edition of This Week in Global Development. The annual South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, is known for its eclectic mix of innovators and policymakers. It's a unique place where film stars and artists co-mingle with tech entrepreneurs and social change makers to discover new ideas and spark inspiration. Increasingly, it's also become a hotspot for global development leaders looking to break out of the usual event circuit echo chamber. I'm here at South By to talk with the leaders about ways that technology and innovation can supercharge the sustainable development goals. Listen in for what's next in a range of sectors from food to health to climate and conflict and how these advancements can reach the most vulnerable. In this episode, we'll dive into the future of food systems with three experts working on this challenge from different angles. Roy Steiner, Senior Vice President for the Food Initiative at the Rockefeller Foundation, is focused on expanding access to nourishing food while also supporting scientific advances in nutrition and sustainable food production. We'll also hear from Paul Noonan, Executive Director of the SDG2 Advocacy Hub, which coordinates global advocacy around the second sustainable development goal, focused on creating a world free of hunger. He founded Beans is How, a global campaign to double bean consumption, and we'll get into why that matters. Finally, we'll narrow in on cocoa beans. Yoka Yertz is the open chain lead at Tony's Chocolonely, a company that's on a mission to end modern slavery and illegal child labor in cocoa. She'll talk about the progress they're making and what more is needed. Technology and AI come up in each of these interviews, and that's no surprise since it's been such a focus here at South By, but it's really interesting to narrow in on technology's role in food systems transformation specifically. Here's Roy Steiner. So we're here at South By where it's a lot of talk about tech, innovation. I think every single panel I've been part of has talked about AI. <laughs> I think it's a requirement here. Um, how are you thinking about tech innovation and maybe even specifically AI being a real catalyst to driving food systems transformation? There's no question that AI is gonna have a, a huge impact. Uh, I, I think the question is, uh, how is it going to be used in our food system in a way that actually promotes all of the objectives that we want? Um, you know, when, when you do an analysis of the, of, of the current food system, we all know that it's, um, you know, pretty detrimental environmentally, but it's also pretty detrimental socially and, and, and nutritionally. Um, if we're going to do the kind of food system transformation that's required, which is moving to a more regenerative, more equitable system. Um, AI needs to be designed to, to do that. It could actually um, negate some of the things that are, are our goals. I mean, for example, uh, you know, technology tends to be um, a fairly neutral tool that, that it, it, it uh, multiplies whatever is underneath it. So if we have a completely inequitable system, it will multiply the inequity. So. AI could make the food system much more inequitable because it uh, depends on who has access to those tools and, and to, that, uh, to the innovation. We're hopeful uh, that it could be used to make the, the system a lot more regenerative. You know, the, the, the reality is right now we have a fairly input intensive system that requires a lot of fertilizer, a lot of agri uh, fossil fuel derived chemicals. Um, and the kind of agriculture we need is one that is biologically and um, knowledge intensive. And AI, of course, could be a really powerful tool, tool there, enabling uh, farmers and producers to, to really make optimal decisions 
uh, under whatever circumstances they're facing. So it could be a, a, a game changer and a leveler in providing information, or it could just enhance the big people to become a lot bigger. And that's the question we're going to have to wrestle with. And so I've heard several folks here talk about you in particular having a really good big picture view of this food systems world. I think you were one of the first hires or set up the food department at the Gates Foundation. Um, and your years of working on these issues. What are the highlights? What's going well? And, and what are the areas that you really want to see more action on? Despite all of its uh, challenges, I think the fact that there was a U UN Food System Summit um, is is actually a is a sign of progress that we're actually starting to think of systems. The biggest challenge in the past is we took a singular goal, yield, and optimized everything around that and didn't really think about the environment and all of the externalities and the impact on nutrition and health. And now we're starting to realize, oh, that's a, not a good way to actually design a system. Uh, you will end up creating something you, you don't want that's creating a lot of damage. And we know that we've we have created a value destroying food system economically at least, uh, and I think in other ways, uh, because we've had that singular focus. So the fact that we've shifted to trying to think about systems, the fact that true cost accounting was actually the, the theme of the most recent flagship report of the uh, Food and Agriculture Association uh, organization, the State of Food and Agriculture, that's actually, pro in my mind, that's big progress and wasn't there 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, we uh, really, a lot of folks in, the, in this field, you know, we just get the magic seed and everything will be okay. Um, and it turns out, no, magic seeds are only part of a whole system and you need to be thinking about that and that's not easy. People like simple solutions um, uh, and, and in this case you need to be able to kind of embrace complexity and embrace interdependence and step up the game in terms of how we as human beings understand our world and create the society we want uh, to create. Well, last year Rockefeller Foundation announced a billion dollar commitment into climate. Um, how is that impacting or evolving your approach to, to food systems? Yes, everything is now climate, yeah. I mean, which makes sense. It, it, makes it is sense, the yeah. ex existential threat uh, facing humanity. Um, well, fortunately, food, uh, or, or I guess, or not fortunately, food, food systems account for as, you know, anywhere from a quarter to a third of all greenhouse gases. It's also the number one driver of biodiversity loss, water quality issues, etc. cetera. So um, you can't solve the climate crisis without uh, addressing food systems. Uh, but unlike many other, other sectors, food systems can also be the solution. We do think it can sequester vast amounts of carbon. Um, it can definitely reduce um, the em emissions uh, really by moving towards more regenerative systems. Um, and uh, and it'll, I think that'll be better for human beings too. It will create more nourishing food as a result. So we're, we're, whatever we're investing in now is we, we, we draw a line towards the, the climate impact it has and, um, and it's going to be a learning process. So what are the big issues you're really thinking about, focused on this year? Yeah, um, well we have four. Um, one is a, our big regenerative agriculture initiative and that's where AI I think has a huge impact on specifically around advisory services for farmers, um, and we'll be, in, be very interested in that. Um, connected to that is, is our School Meals program. Um, School Meals is the largest public safety net in the world, and we want to help work with the, the School Meals Coalition to expand it to 100 million more children and make it more regenerative. It could be a real driver of diverse crops, right? One of the biggest problems, we have so little diversity in our core crops and yet there are thousands and thousands of edible plants and lots of really amazing uh, uh, foods that we could be using that could make us more, uh, more healthy. Um, and so if we can use school meals as a way to 
to drive that diversity, that could be really great because it's a win-win school. And it helps drive that behavior yeah, change behavior too, Yeah, behavior right? change, you build, you, you teach the next generation to eat healthier, and you drive, you create a market for, for these things. So we're pretty excited by that. Um, we've invested in, in something called the Periodic Table of Food Initiative, which is a whole, uh, it's the next frontier in terms of measuring the food composition um, uh, of, of all of our amazing foods that we have. Um, you know, uh, right now, it's traditional food composition tables, like what the, what's done in the USDA or any other national uh, uh, body, is measures at most about 150 molecules. Our, uh, an average human diet has at a minimum 26,000 molecules. So we measure and understand less than 1% of the molecules we put into our body. I mean, that's incredible. 99% is like unknown territory. Uh, and yet we know 70 to 70, 80% of all diseases are now diet related. Don't you think we need to understand our food a little bit more? So we're investing in this network of, of laboratories mass spec using mass spectrometry and the latest bioinformatics, another place where AI is going to be pretty important to really start uh, laying out, here's the full spectrum of molecules. And then now we can start asking questions around how do you grow the most nutritious food? What's the impact of, of that food in, in for various people? And then the fourth is our Food is Medicine initiative, which is to enable um, doctors in the United States to prescribe fruits, vegetables, diets, and have the health insurance company pay for it. And so we're funding a whole range of randomized controlled trials to prove that to the insurance companies that this actually makes sense. And by the way, it really does. <laughs> and it's kind of intuitive that it does because who knew? Uh, food is cheaper than pharmaceuticals and in many disease states quite uh, effective. So, um, so we're And what's been the excited. response to that? Uh, quite, a, there's, there's a big food is medicine movement happening. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, we have the American Heart Association, which is a very traditional medical association, suddenly, you know, really working on this and, and many others. And I think it's going to transform the healthcare system of the United States. It, it has a very good pro probability of doing that. And is there opportunity um, as you work globally, think about health systems that are still being further developed now, being able to integrate this in while some of these systems, you know, but post COVID, there's a lot of focus on health system strengthening and what opportunities do you see for having food be part of that conversation? Well, we hope it, it will be. We, we hope, you know, down the line, when, it, when you meet with a doctor, the first thing they're gonna ask you is, so what are you eating? And, and then they're gonna have a set of things, oh, you should eat more of this because that'll rebalance your body. Because I think that disease is often a state of imbalance in, in, in the body. Um, uh, and we know that it's, it's very effective uh, at, at addressing um, and even making the current medicines that are being used more effective if you have a good nutrition. It kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, which is a wonder that so much hospital food is so terrible. Like, <laughs> it's a kind of a real contradiction uh, there. But, uh, but yeah, I think it, if you can introduce that and like a sick person needs really good nutrition, and that, by the way, is food that's grown regeneratively or, or from agroecologically. Um, so that's, that's exciting that we could create a whole demand, large demand for uh, more healthy uh, uh, locally grown food, for example. The world is facing a range of health threats, from an increase in disease outbreaks to the health impacts of climate change. I'm Janelle Ravelo, Senior Global Health Reporter for DevEx. Every Thursday, we bring you exclusive news and insights on how the health sector is finding solutions to these challenges in our free weekly newsletter, DevEx Checkup. Visit devex.com slash newsletters to subscribe. Like Roy, Paul Noonan of the SDG2 Advocacy Hub is focused on making food systems more sustainable and nutritious. And he sees beans, peas, and lentils as an important part of that future. Here's my conversation with Paul on the role of technology 
advocacy, and legumes and food system transformation. You know, you and I see each other often at COP, UNGA, a lot of these very traditional UN-focused type of convenings. Um, so how do you find this different than some of those others, and how do you find um, people being receptive to the work that you're doing and feeling like, oh, okay, I could maybe con contribute to that? Yeah, look, I think it's, it's really interesting because what you find is not the traditional crowd here but you have people that are really interested in making an impact in the world in different issues, in different ways. Many filmmakers and creatives are really passionate about what's going on in the world. Um, some of them are actually using their craft to, to tell stories, to um, speak from their platforms. Um, and I think also food is such a, a uniter. So food is such a connection. We're in Austin, there's an amazing food scene here. So food, people are talking about where they can eat. Everyone's eating in different places. There's lots of kind of food dialogue. And so when you, you mention that you work on food and food systems, people are automatically starting to say, oh, okay, cool, what does that look like? I mean, I was walking along and I've got a, a beans is how bag and, and somebody stopped me in the street and they said, beans, I just had some beans, you know. And so it's about helping them see that the issues that we're talking about actually matter alongside the issues and the entertainment sometimes and the, the conversations and dialogues that are happening. And, you know, there is a food track, there is the climate track. And so it's also through those spaces, ensuring that we're representing some of these, these more global conversations, these advocacy platforms into those conversations to, to, to really make sure the right points are being made, the right um, connections are being made to some of the broader efforts that are going on around the world as well. So you and I were both at an event earlier this week, um, Tech Nourish, that was looking at the intersection of food and, and technology. Um, what are some of the exciting things you are seeing in the world of food and tech, ag and tech? Um, what are some of those opportunities? What more do you think needs to be done to leverage them? When I think about this um, and I think about tech, I always think about it from a, both sides. So I think tech can be a real solution for us. You know, technology is helping us to think differently about um, different processes and challenges and make things more effective and efficient. But at the same time, we've got to think about what could it be taking away from us and what are the things that we might be losing. And so I always sort of say, let's look back to look forward. So how do we think about the challenges that we're facing, what are the things that technology and other advancements can help us around. So let's think about, for example, um, something like the protein challenge. You have a lot of alternate proteins really starting to think through how do we create more effective, cost-effective, timely, low climate impact, nutritious options. But at the same time, we can look back and we can say, where are there foods in which traditionally indigenous people, others have used for years that actually also create solutions. And how do we bring the two together? So how do we look forward and think about the elements that are there, but also look back and ensure that we're not forgetting something or moving past something that's a solution that we can need to bring into the future. And sometimes I think it's about the technology helping to solve a problem. So it might be about storage or distribution, or it might be about how do we increase um, the, the, the convenience factors around something. So a, a really practical example is a lot of people think about, um, we do a lot of work on, on pulses, and pulses are beans, peas, and lentils. They're the, the, the dry form. Um, and a lot of people will say, you know, you can eat them in all different types. Um, you, you can eat them, uh, you, you know, to cook them, you, you have to um, soak them or you have to ferment them or you have to activate them in some sort of way. And so, but in order to store them, you can store them dry. Now, if you think about this, there's a convenience factor that comes in. So people say, I don't have time to cook beans from dry because they take a long time. There are ways around that. You can soak them and you can do that. But there's also convenience solutions that I'm seeing. So I've seen in, um, I was in Rwanda and I was uh, looking at different solutions there and we found a company that was um, taking beans, they were, they were soaking them and then they were putting them into almost like a, a pouch, 
similar to what you can get, like sometimes rice or things like this to microwave or that kind of, but they're putting them in these pouches and then they were steam cooking them in the pouch. You don't open the pouch again, so it locks in all the nutrients. But because they were doing the cooking that way, in difference to the traditional way to boil them on a, in a, on a stove, often using firewood, they were getting a carbon credit. And then they were providing them for school meals. So there's this like connection being made where you can use a technology, which is quite simple. It's steaming in many ways, like this steam pressure. It's having a massive climate impact, but it's also making a convenience factor for the eater. And they will be able to provide them to schools and they were able to provide them for families. So there's these kinds of things which can overcome technologies, which can overcome some of the things we see in that kind of way. Yeah, and I think that what is good about this initiative, you say it's, it's kind of focused, and the whole food system, it can feel very daunting and overwhelming, and any individual or institution is just one part of that system to feel like, okay, we can actually yeah. enact change. That focus, I think, is great. What, like, how do you see that approach being able to scale to other parts of the food system? Is that something you're thinking about? Yeah, so we've been thinking a lot. And I, I actually think, you know, some people say, oh, so you're saying beans are the answer. And I'm saying beans are an answer, yes. But they're not the only answer. Our food system, one of the challenges in our food system is that it's become very, it, it, it's, it's had a huge amount of, a, like, a lack of diversity. And that diversity has been for a reason. You know, the diversity was there to make the system healthy. Why we've reduced some of that diversity, maybe in, unintentionally, is to try and feed everyone in the world. And so through trying to feed everyone in the world, we've doubled down on certain crops and we've got them more effective and more efficient in the way that we're producing them. One of the unintended consequences is that people eat a lot more of those things and so for me, as we think of the solution, it's about saying, how do we get other families of crops? How do we increase that? So we kind of decreased it and the systems kind of become smaller and smaller. How do we open it back up? So what are the families of crops that we should be eating more of? And so I think of, you know, beans, peas and lentils are there. Millets, last year was International Year of Millets. And I think millets are great. High nutrition low water usage, about a fifth of the water than rice, you know, so really good from that perspective, quite affordable. Um, so I think millet's a key. Seaweed's another one that I would say. Seaweed is something that really we should be bringing more into our diet, available all around the world, wherever there's water. Um, and so quite, you know, diverse. It's not, you know, there are some landlocked countries, but, you know, seaweed is quite, quite out there. Um, and so thinking about the types of foods that we should be eating and eating more of and how do we get more of that out there in the diet. And I think for me, that means we need lots of campaigns around helping people to kind of make those choices of things that are more nutritious, better for the planet, and also more accessible and affordable and try and work out how do we do that en masse. And I think that's part of the way we're gonna change the food system. There's been a lot of discussion around food as medicine uh, here this week at South By that I've attended. Um, so how do you see that fitting into the conversation? And um, is that something you're, you're messaging? Is that you know, food not only can't be a source of unhealth, but it can be a real source of, of true health? Yeah, so I, the way I like to think about that is prevention. Um, and so how do you make yourself, how do you, how do you kind of, what are the things you can do to be healthy? I think the food is medicine message for me is a little challenging because medicine is something no one really likes to take. And the medical system has been built on a, on a treatment model. So it's, it's built around a business model that's about treating people and treating things. Food is medicine, I think, is trying to do the opposite of that. It's about prevention. And, and trying to raise the awareness that food can be something that can help you be healthy. But I think you're going up against a big industry that's built around treatment. And so I think there is a bit of a challenge there of trying to kind of compete in that space. Um, for me, it's more about, well, how do you think about people understanding what makes them healthy? So, you know, how do you think, and as, you know, for people in our audience that are working on food advocacy or advocacy in general, 
thinking about those different audiences and how you craft messages to them um, that will speak to those unique audiences, but without diluting the overall message that you're trying to send through a campaign? What I've found in my experience is using questions is key, or words that open up, what do you mean? So we created a, a, a narrative around the work that we do called Good Food for All, and it was built with a number of partners um, and agencies that were all looking at this kind of space around zero hunger and around food advocacy and food system transformation. And this narrative platform was utilized during the UN food system and adopted as kind of the, the public engagement framework. And when you say good food, people go, well, what do you mean? That's the first thing they ask. And you go, well, what do you think? And I think part of the challenge is how do you get people interested and engaged? But also, how do you do it in such a way that doesn't, definitions or a, or a campaign doesn't close people out? And I think sometimes we do that really quickly. And so it's about how you open it up. Because food means so many things to everyone. We talked a bit before about it being so personal. And when you think about food, every one of us will define what good food looks like and what bad food looks like. It could be about who you eat with. It could be about what you eat. It could be about the impact of that on your body. It could be the impact of that on the planet. It could be... so. And all of that's kind of correct. So when we think about good food, we, we started to define that it begins with farmers, it's nutritious. So we started to kind of build out the layers behind it. But start out with something that kind of helps to put a, because you can just have food that's bad, but we want good food. And then we kind of want it for everyone. And there's kind of a, you can't really enjoy food if not everyone has it. You know, if you've ever sat there and somebody's hungry and you see them, it becomes a, it just, there's something, it takes something away from the experience you're having. And, and I think this is about our commonality as humanity. And so when I think about these narratives, these are the kinds of questions I ask. And who are we excluding and who are we including through the way that we're doing things? How are we activating in people energy to help them ask questions? And how are we building an openness to the complexity of the things that sit behind often our simple taglines or starting point. Are you looking for the inside story on what's happening at organisations like the World Bank, USAID or the Gates Foundation? Then you need to be reading DevX Pro. I'm Jessica Abrahams and I'm the editor of DevX Pro. Pro is DevX's premium news subscription, where our expert reporters and analysts take you beyond the headlines, deep into the trends and institutions shaping the $200 billion aid industry. As well as all our news, you'll get access to conversations with global development leaders, resources to help you grow in your career, and a subscriber-only newsletter full of insider news and tidbits. See for yourself by getting a free trial today at devx.com pro. Now we'll narrow in on cocoa beans specifically. Yoka Yertz from Tony Chakalonely is focused on ethical sourcing, and the approaches that she and her colleagues are taking hold lessons that can apply far beyond the cocoa sector. Well, hi, Yoka. Thank you so much for joining me today at the All Things Food Summit at South by Southwest, hosted by Food Tank, where you just uh, were on a fireside chat talking about Tony's Chocoloni. So for our audience who's less familiar with your chocolate brand, can you talk a little bit about who you are and why you came to be? Yeah, um, Tony's Chocoloni has been around for 18 years, but probably only visible in the United States for um, half of that. Um, but it's a, it's a chocolate company um, that really started as a form of outrage after learning how prevalent child labor is in the cocoa supply chain. Um, Tony Sugar Lonely started with a red bar, alarm colored red, alert, alert, there's a huge issue in uh, cocoa and it's child labor. 
Um, we've grown a lot since then. We've learned a lot about cocoa. Uh, we've learned a lot how to tackle issues in cocoa. And the truth about tackling issues in cocoa is that it's really multifaceted. Uh, we call it, you know, um, that we say, we say that our mission is to end exploitation in cocoa because child labor is a symptom of a more, uh, a deeper problem, which is really poverty. Um, in the supply chain. So 60% of the world's cocoa comes from Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, and it's all smallholders who grow it. Um, the, the average uh, income is way below the poverty line. And when you are poor, you do not have as many choices. So that leads to things like child labor being extremely prevalent, but also cocoa-led deforestation being an issue in West Africa. So Tony Shukalonli has set up a whole sourcing model to tackle all three of those issues. We call it the five sourcing principles. Um, and it's where we commit long-term directly to um, uh, partner cooperatives. Uh, we work with the cooperatives. We're very co-op-centric in our approach. We pay way more for cocoa. We pay a price that enables a living income. Uh, we help the co-op find and remediate cases of child labor. We work on productivity together. So we have this whole way of working. And with Tony Shuk the, what I do at Tony's is I'm part of Tony's Open Chain. Tony Shugal only realized quite quickly that to really make an impact, we have to share our sourcing model. It's really stronger together. It was never just about Tony's chocolate. It's about all chocolate worldwide. So at Tony's Open Chain, we actively ask other brands to join us in our commitment to end exploitation in cocoa. And uh, we've been doing that for four or five years. We have about 15 companies now who source along with us. And um, we just can make a lot more impact by doing it together. That's amazing. And you, you mentioned 60% of cocoa comes from Cote d'Ivoire and, and Ghana. Yet um, you may know the stat, but I'm at, it's a very small percentage of the uh, revenue from that chocolate eventually makes it down to the farmers when you think about um, what a big global business chocolate is and most that value gets added outside of those countries. Um, so how do you see the system being able to better support the farmers? You mentioned paying an actual living wage. Um, but how do you see this kind of helping to remediate some of the inequities that exist, particularly in the cocoa sector? Yeah, that's absolutely right. The way pricing works in chocolate and in the cocoa supply chain, um, it's a business, um, but it is in no way set up to serve farmers. Farmers have very little voice, very little control over uh, what prices they sell their cocoa at. Actually, it is a price set by the government. Um, and the how that price is set is a complex, not really transparent um, process. Uh, but what we do know is the farm gate price is consistently under a level that allows cocoa farmers to earn a living income. Right now, if you look at what's happening in the cocoa market, cocoa prices are crazy high. Um, and that is due to a combination of demand for cocoa being up and production for cocoa being down. Climate change is affecting farmers. Uh, production is low. Uh, farmers don't have the resources to invest into their farm. So there are, all kinds of re there are all kinds of crazy things going on in the market. But the truth is, even with prices really high for chocolate brands or chocolate traders, the farmers are not experiencing the joys of, of a boom in pricing. Our commitment at Tony's um, and that all the mission allies who, who source with us, our commitment is to pay a price that enables a living income. So no matter what the farm gate price is, we always top up to that level that enables a farmer, farming household to enable to earn a living income. And what have been some of the biggest challenges and barriers to really trying to fix this supply chain issue? We have learned so much. I think we get uh, better and better every single year in terms of um, working together with the co-ops, putting them more central into our way of working. I think a lot of sustainability programs try to almost impose a way of working on groups of farmers. I think we've gotten better at better, better and better at, um, at having the work really come from them. So we set the framework together um, and they're the ones who execute the work and we, we reward them for that work. We pay them for that work. So they're very incentivized and it's a true partnership. A true partnership. Yeah, exactly. Um, some of the challenges have been um, convincing, <laughs> well, we've had success in convincing others to join us, but um, it does cost more to source fairer, sustainable cocoa. Um, and not everybody feels ready to do that or stick their neck out to do that. Um, 
Other companies also can get quite scared sometimes about how transparent our reporting is. Uh, we report very transparently every year exactly how many yeah, cases I wanted of to ask child about labor that, we you find. You yeah. seem to be very open about that and it's part of your ethos that you want to be transparent because it holds yourself accountable to. That... Exactly. It's part of our commitment. I mean, if you can't find cases of child labor, then you also can't remediate it. So you can't uh, make it better unless you know about the problems. I mean, we've really had incredible success in this area because if you look at the co-ops where we've been working with for over three years, not just on finding cases of child labor and remediating them, but also um, driving farmer incomes up by paying the mayor for, more for cocoa, uh, by paying the co-op for the work that they're doing, by working on productivity, by working on community development. That whole combination of things leads to change. So instead of uh, a 50% child labor prevalence rate with co-ops, we are seeing a below 4% child labor prevalence in the co-ops we've been working with for a long time. That is so encouraging. And having that kind of impact really helps us grow our story. When other companies hear that, they say, okay, yes, we do want to pay more for cocoa. This is, this is the change we all know we need, that we've known for 30 years that we need to make in cocoa. So once the needle starts moving, it can be really, really encouraging. And that's kind of what we want to do at Tony's Open Chain is create, show that it can be done and then create an unstoppable movement that this is the way to, uh, to source cocoa. So talk to me about what kind of people you've brought into that and, you know, how many different organizations you're working with and companies and, um, you know, what, what are some of the challenges maybe in bringing them in and then the opportunities they see once they start working in this new way? Yeah, we feel really strongly that um, we want to be an example in the world of how change can happen. Um, and so you can't keep that for yourself. You have to share it with others. Um, I'm really proud of the Tony Shukalone leadership and board because it does sometimes mean onboarding a brand that might look like you or share the same shelf space as you or compete for the same shelf space at the same retailer as you. Um, but what I always say is that we want to collaborate on cocoa and then you want to compete on chocolate. So you want to compete on the shelf on who has the tastiest chocolate or, you know, branding or wrapping that, that appeals to the consumer. But in turn, you can't, you can't compete on child labor. You can't compete on deforestation. That is something um, that we all share together. And Tony's has picked over and over and over again to onboard brands, even if they are, you know, if you, from a consumer perspective, a choice, a consumer is going to pick a brand A or brand B. Um, we have about 15 companies that join us now. So this year we'll do um, 18,000 tons of, uh, 18,000 metric tons of cocoa sourced out of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. About a third of that is Tony Chocolonely and about two thirds of that is uh, Mission Allies or it might be half and half now. I'm not sure what the proportions are, but the point is that the, the footprint we make together is so much bigger by collaborating, which is why it's so important that we do that. So in a lot of discussion around food system transformation, there's a little debate or in friction over does the responsibility rely with the consumer who is making these choices and pushing the market to change, or does it uh, lie with the you know producers uh, that are making this food to change the way? So I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that. So I think I've been working in food and farming for 20 years, and I think we've ping ponged between putting the relation, putting the responsibility on consumers. And there are consumers who know about issues and make smart choices, make conscious choices. Um, and we've also in the last 20 years put a lot of responsibility on farmers. If, you know, with a message of, if you guys just produced more cocoa, you would be out of poverty. Yeah, but to produce more cocoa costs more money. So you can't, you know, farm yourself out of poverty. You actually, there needs to be other uh, responsibilities taken. So I want to see a lot more of that responsibility pushed towards the middle of the supply chain, um, towards the ones who can control what prices consumers pay and can control uh, the due diligence that they do uh, deeper in their supply chain. Um, so we need to see that shift and we are seeing it a little bit in, in, in legislation coming in Europe. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, choices that consumers make. Um, 
Tony Shukalovni and the Mission Eyes are a very good choice. But in the end, nobody does pity purchasing. You buy chocolate because it tastes good. Um, so I do want to move towards a world where consumers aren't faced with that choice, the chocolate that is offered to them on shelf. We know that farmers are fairly remunerated, that children are in school, that forests are protected. That should be the level playing field, and that is going to come with legislation. Well, one of the good things about being a food event is all of the food, mm -hmm. and so I was able to nab a chocolate bar. I look forward to yes. <laughs> eating later. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Yoke, for spending um, some time with us today and, and sharing more about your way of fixing the cocoa supply chains. Thanks for listening to DevX at South by Southwest, a special edition of This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it, or you can also leave us a rating or a review. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. If you want to share feedback on this episode or have any questions you'd like answered, we'd love to hear from you. Drop me a message on social media at Kate D. Warren or send an email to podcast at devx.com. DevX at South by Southwest is a podcast from DevX. It's hosted by me, Kate Warren. Today's episode was produced by Katherine Cheney and edited by Naomi Mihara.